You know, as we continue on our message series this morning, The Great I Am, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, what life are you trying to build? So often we try to build our lives in certain different ways to build what we want it to be. You know, it makes me really think, back when I was a kid, the singer that was the bomb diggity was Bon Jovi. Come on, you know it. And his song, It's My Life. I mean, this just makes me, gets my vibe going. I mean, come on, sing with it. It's my life. It's now or never. Don't. What? No. No. Uh, we'll do it for you. Thank you. you're going to do some karaoke to Bon Jovi this morning, did you? For all you people who wandered in here because you lost an hour to sleep, I hope you're woken up now. Yeah, dog. But so often, we live that way, don't we? We live the Bon Jovi theme song, It's My Life, It's Now or Never, I Ain't Gonna Live Forever, and like Frankie said, I did it my way. And that's how we kind of build our lives, don't we? We build our lives my way. And truth be told, many times we try to build my life my way. And our focus, because of that, so often is about building our own kingdoms. Building the structure of my world the way I want my world to be. It's my life. I don't have many years to live anyways, so let me live it my way and do my own thing. In a lot of ways, that Bon Jovi song is, a, is an anthem of our lives. But is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? Because no matter how hard we try, we try to build this life, we try to build our own world, and in so doing, we're in this constant battle. We're in this constant battle with the reality that death is on the horizon. And so like, me, like all of us in this battle together, we try to save ourselves from death. We try to build our own quality of life. If I can build my life my way and do the best I can to provide my own quality of life, then I will be happy. But no matter how hard we try, no matter what great breakthroughs we have in the medical field, no matter what you try to develop, no matter what medicines you create, death still comes. You can't can't escape it. I mean, so often we pray for our health, and yes, we need to do that, and I'm not trying to sidestep that, but so often I pray, God, please make me healthy, make my family healthy, please don't let this bad thing happen to us, but in reality, he could heal us today, but still it does not escape the reality, one day death will come. One day we will be in the same position, the same boat, dealing with it. No matter how hard we try, we still encounter death. We still encounter death. Death is the one reality of life. So the question is, how can we really prolong death? How can we do that? What is our focus? And I think we got to get back to a more basic question. How do we define death? What is death? You know, all throughout the course of history, we've tried to determine when a person is dead. We, we've used the ability if they're breathing, right? And then if you read the old historical stories, you see people who are accidentally buried alive and they had to ring the bell in order to save them. Wouldn't that be awful? And so we souped up our abilities to better define death based upon a person's heart function, brain waves, and you put all that math together and we determine when a person has actually died. But it's most basic understanding, death is a separation. It's a separation. One day, your physical body will separate from your spiritual body. See, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God created us in his image, which means we all have a spiritual self. And one day, your spiritual self will separate from your physical self. That is death. 
Death is separation. And we all have to face that. As, 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 as hard as you try not to, one day you will face death. And so I. That is a guaranteed part of our future. Not to bring you down to the low spot today. But there's another death. That death is the spiritual death. Just like our physical body separates from our spiritual soul, there is a separation spiritually that is our separation of our spiritual self from God for all eternity. <clears throat> That's the death that the Bible says you do not have to experience. You do not have to live out that eternity in eternal death. You can live out with eternal life. And in, the, in Romans 6.23, the apostle Paul puts it this way. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me read that again just so it really sinks in. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Did you get that? Wages. Paul says your wages, the thing that you earn, how you live your life, the life that you try to build, the choices that you make, what you earn from that is death. I mean, we all understand what wages are. That's not like a news flash for you today. Wages are what you earn based upon what you do. If you go to work tomorrow, you expect to pay, be paid a certain amount based upon what you were agreed upon when you took that job. So if you work your eight hours tomorrow, you expect to receive the pay for those eight hours. That's the wages. You earned it. And what Paul is saying, when your anthem of life is to build your own life your way, your own choices, how you want to develop it, your wages, what you earn is death. Is death. And we see that reality play out from the very beginning of the Bible all the way back in the Old Testament in Genesis. You see, because there's, a, there's two people named Adam and Eve. You know their story. God put them in the garden, everything was perfect, and he gave them a choice. And we often ask God, why, why did you give them a choice? <laughs> because ultimately God wants you to love him. He wants you to choose to love him the same way he chose to love you. That's why. And so he gave Adam and Eve a choice in the garden. And they chose, based upon the uh, urging of the serpent, which was the devil, to, hey, God's holding out on you. What if you build your life your way? What if you build your own kingdom? Have the fruit. Have the fruit. Doesn't it look good? Doesn't that life look good if you could build it? And you know the story, they ate the fruit and sin came in and we see the reality of this verse play out. For the wages of, uh, for the wages of sin is death. And we see how death came into the world and how it slowly brought on the, the, the consequences and the brokenness in their lives and in the future lives of all mankind. The life we try to build just continues to have an encounter with death. The choices we make in our efforts to build our own lives just brings on death. Life offers one certainty. You will die. Life offers one guarantee. No matter how hard you try to build your life, you will experience brokenness and pain and disappointment. That is one guarantee. But look what Paul wrote. For the wages of sin is death, but... Don't you love when the big old butts get in the way? But God's gift is eternal life. You guys, don't miss this. Because as you try to build your life, in turn, what you're trying to do is to try to develop for yourself a life of joy, of happiness, of peace, of no pain, of no suffering, where you can just enjoy everything that you got going on around you. But so often, the more we try to build our life, the more we walk into destruction. But the Bible says the more you try to find your life in him, there you find life. You know why? Because God's gift is life. 
That's what it is. God desperately wants to give to you life. But so often we walk around in death, in brokenness, because we're so focused on trying to build my life my way. Because that's what Frankie said. But it never works. It never works. You know, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, you know what was going on? It's a story found in John chapter 11. And in this story, we see Jesus encounter death. In fact, this death was very personable to Jesus. If you, you're probably familiar with the story in John chapter 11 with Jesus and what the Bible describes as his very good friend, Lazarus. Now, Jesus was off in the distant country, and they've sent word to Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick, and not just sick like he has to blow his nose. He is sick. He is about to die. Please come. Please come. But for whatever reason, the Bible says that Jesus waited four more days. He waited four more days. And by the time he got to Bethany, where all this was going down, Lazarus had already died and was buried in the tomb. And there he was. And in that moment, we see Mary and Martha and the whole community run toward Jesus with the question that we always tend to ask, and every one of us has probably wrestled with this question when we face heartache and brokenness in our life, and that's the question of why. Why did you have to let this happen? Why did you not come here? We know who you are, and if you would have come here, this did not have to happen. Why? And I wonder how many of us right now in this moment are wrestling with that same question. Why? I can't tell you how many times in my life I've walked through heartache and brokenness and I went to the throne of God with so much anger and hurt and frustration with that one question. Why? Why does this have to happen? Why did you not intercede and stop this? Why didn't you heal them? Why didn't you make this consequence not happen? Why did you make, allow this person to make this choice? Why? We all wrestle with that question. The foundation of our brokenness, the foundation of our disappointment with God all centers around this one question. And I'll be honest with you, I may not have all the answers. And you may not fully have all the answers on this side of heaven. And that's what makes that question so hard to wrestle with. But God's gift is life. And in his interaction with Mary and Martha and the whole community, Jesus shit revealed something. He revealed the reality of God's heart. God's heart breaks when your heart breaks. When you're broken, he breaks right alongside you. The shortest verse in all the Bibles found here, Jesus wept. In all of the scriptures, and all the gospels, this is the one spot where you see the man, Jesus, emotionally break down. He breaks down, and he's overwhelmed with that. And they're just saying, Jesus, why? Why did you let this happen? Why didn't you raise him up? And here we can pick up the story in John 11, verses 21 through 26. Lord... Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. You know, you kind of see that? It's like, I get it, Jesus. He's going to be in heaven. I'm going to see him in heaven one day. You're missing the point. I want him here now. That's the heart of her message. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know what Jesus is saying here? If I, want, if I can put it in just in a quick one set in layman's terms, he says, death will not have the last word, Mary and Martha. 
death will never be victorious in me. I am the resurrection. I am life. The resurrection will take place. And Jesus expressed a heartache and sadness towards the people that were grieving on this day. You know why? Because they were so focused on building their life here. And Jesus was trying to get them to see the glimpse of the reality of eternal life with him. We're always focused on the physical life, and Jesus is always focused on the eternal life. And he's saying, listen, I could bring you back here, but you're missing it. You're still going to experience death. I have something so much better for you. So much better for you. Can you see that? Can you see that? This world will always be broken. This world around you will always be destructive. But I have life. Jesus' desire in this moment is to, is to divert our focus from the abstract belief to a personalized belief in him that he is the only one that can provide life. He is not just the only one who can provide life. He is life. There is no life apart from him. Apart from him is only death. You go back all the way to the Garden of Eden, that's the reality that was showcased there. The perfect, wonderful thing about the garden is that they were in the very presence of God. And by that, they experienced the full reality of life in him. But the devil mixed their minds up. They wanted more. And they ate that fruit. And when that fruit came, it caused a separation between them and God. And in that moment, they saw the reality of life apart from him. Which, guess what? There really is none. Because apart from him, who is the author of life, all there is is the onslaught of death. And that's the reality that we see take shape in Genesis and completely play out in the man Jesus. And Jesus said, I am life. You will never be able to have life apart from me. Apart from me, you will always be experiencing the grave, death and destruction, heartache and pain. But I am am life. And see, the problem is what Jesus was dealing with with these people was this abstract faith, of an abstract faith that I think we all wrestle with as well. You see, abstract is, is believing that something exists in thought or an idea, but doesn't really have a concrete existence. You know, it's kind of like whatever your mind makes it up to be. I'm not a big fan of going to art museums. Have, if you've been to an art museum, you walk down there and you see the abstract art and I just stand there and I'm just thinking, what in the world is this? I mean, I think I should become an artist. Just, just put something on the wall and just start throwing paint up there and then sell it for like a million dollars. I'd be a rich man. That might not be a bad idea because then you can just make something up. Well, see, when I was making this, I was just thinking of this boy that was down by the river living in a van. You guys see where I'm going? SNL fans? Okay, never mind. But it's just abstract. It's whatever you make it to, make it to be. And the truth is, like, it could, it could exist, but I don't really know. I'm, it might offer some good, but I don't really see it all. And that's the abstract view we tend to have of Jesus. Like, we all, at some point, we're here because at some point we're kind of like, I think he exists. I think he's a good guy. I think he can help me in some areas of my life. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 you're missing it. If he's just kind of abstract. If all I am is just kind of a... A, a viewpoint for you. If all I am is a maybe you could help me out, kind of a wish upon a lucky star that I'll come through and help you out. If that's all I am for you, you're missing it. See, what Jesus is trying to walk them towards and walk us towards is beyond an abstract view of him to a personalized view of him. A real and concrete belief 
that affects me directly. I don't just think he's some good guy that maybe he can come through when life is hard. I believe everything he says, that he is life. And he is my life, which means everything about him and what he says and what he does directly affects everything about me and what I do and how I live and the choices I make. Not only does Jesus raise from the dead, but he is life. He is life. There is no eternal life or resurrection outside of him. And what Jesus is trying to ask here in this moment, can your faith go beyond just a simple confidence, some abstract view that maybe God can help me when life is hard to a personal trust that you are my life? Apart from you, I am nothing. And I think we're all at these different levels of journey with Jesus. We're all at these different levels. I mean, check this out. I think we all can find ourselves somewhere on this circle. And I think the question I want to ask you and really have you wrestle with today, where do you find yourself at? Where do you find yourself out? Some of you may be sitting here today or watching online and you're in that first circle, complete unbelief. I don't think I believe in Jesus. I don't know who he is. I don't think I buy into any of that stuff. Some of you are there. Some of you are in the other quadrant where you kind of took a step from unbelief to more of a little personalization of it to he seems kind of cool. I mean, I like the stories. I like the whole Jesus' love aspect and all the stuff that I kind of see he says um, on the good stuff, how he's going to come through and, and kind of be there for me. Maybe he can make me feel good about myself. He's more of that emotional boost to help me feel, have a positive vibe for the week. And he's kind of a cool guy. And all this on the left side, that's the abstract faith. That's the side where you kind of just paint your picture of the Jesus you want him to be or you think he is that fits better for you or the life you're trying to build. That's the abstract side. But the goal is, how do I move further down the line to a more personalized faith to a point to where maybe he can help me? I think that's the first step beyond just, he's a cool guy. I kind of like some of his stories to maybe he can help me. And some of you are probably in that middle. You're kind of like standing the gap between an abstract faith of the Jesus you want him to be and what he really means to be your life. And you're in this kind of going back and forth that I think he's kind of cool and maybe he can help me. And you're trying to throw some leaflets out like, okay, show me that you can help me, God. Come through for me. Heal me in this way. Do this for me. Give me this job. Help me to buy this car. Help me to have this life. And we just kind of throw leaflets out there. We're not really following him as our life. We're just kind of like, hey, show up and do something good for me. Give me the mental boost I need for this week. Make today good. But at some point, we need to cross over that boundary of an abstract faith, faith to a more personalized faith, to something that's more real, that's something that's more life-transforming. And to be honest, you'll never fully realize the life that he wants to give to you until you take that step. It just won't happen. That step of he's a part of me, he's a bigger part of me, to that final step, he is my life. He's my life. Everything about what he says conducts the person that I am, or at least I try to be. It it conducts my choices. It conducts everything about me. Where do you think you're at in that journey? Where do you think you're at that journey? What's holding you back from taking that next step? From experiencing the reality of Jesus as your life, in your life? I think we need to wrestle with that. We're all somewhere in one of those circles. 
Paul wrote this in Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. The word here, confession, Jesus as Lord. In other words, it's saying, you are my boss. You are my owner. Everything you say, I do. Wherever you say to go, I go. How you tell me to build my life is how I build my life because you are my life. This is the public revelation of a complete submission to his word and his will. I am completely submitting to him as my Lord, as my boss. He is my life. He has my heart. He has all of me. Did you know that in the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as Savior only two times but he's referred to as Lord 92 times. In our day and age, throughout the history of mankind, we want to view Jesus as our savior, as the person who just gives me a boost for the day. When he says, no, I want to be your Lord, the director of your life, so that you can experience the life that I have for you. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Savior 10 times, and he's referred to as Lord 700 times. What's that telling you guys? Jesus is just not this genie to wish upon a star to make your life go better. He is our boss, our owner, our director of life, so that we can experience his life in our lives. And Paul said, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You see, this believing is not just the basic facts. It's not like Jesus is just kind of like a good guy out there having some sort of abstract belief. It's moving towards a personalized belief that accepts the full meaning, the full reality, the full significance of what this means of committing my life to him. That all the implications of what that means, he directs my path. He is the author of my choices. Because he was raised from the dead. He is the resurrection and and the life. You see, my friends, belief and confession, they can't be separated. They can't be separated. They go hand in hand. And inward belief is what's going on in our hearts, revealed itself in who we are outwardly. It's inseparably. How God's work in your life reveals in the choices you make. You see, true faith is never silent. It's never silent. It always confesses. When Paul says confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, it's like this impossibility. When he is the author of my life, when he is my life, it's a personalized reality in who I am. It's impossible to hide the fact I'm alive because of what he's doing in my life and through my life. He is the resurrection. I am done building my life my way because Frankie said that. I am building my life in him because apart from him, there is no life. Apart from him, I'm just constantly running towards death and brokenness and being beat up. But in him, I have victory. I have life. You know what the signs of death are in your life if you're walking in death? The Bible examines them as selfish motives, sexual impurity, idolatry, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, division, constant arguments in your life, and envy. But you know what the signs of life are? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are what the Bible calls the fruits of the Spirit. When God is the life for you, it is inevitable these fruits will be exhibited outside of you. The fruit we live by is the fruit we share. It's the fruit we share. It's inevitable. His life transforms. And even though there may be death around us, We walk in life. We walk in life. Going back to an Old Testament story, there's a man by the name of Jonah. I'm sure you know this story. It's one that if you grew up in Sunday school, you've heard about quite a bit. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. To go to Nineveh to to preach 
the good news of, of who he was to them, to, kind of, to call them to repent. Nineveh was, a, was the biggest, baddest country, country on the block, and they did bad things. And Jonah was angry that he was even being called there, so he ran. Fast forward through the story, you know, he ran, he jumped on the boat, he was hiding on the boat, the big storm came, the fish came, they threw him in the water, the, the big fish ate him, he was in the belly, the belly vomited him up. That's probably one of the grossest stories in the Bible. And God said, I'm still calling you to go to Nineveh. You still need to be hope in those people's lives. And reluctantly, Jonah went to Nineveh and, and told the people to turn to God. And they did. They did. They found life. They were walking in death. The people of Nineveh, it seemed impossible, but they found life in God. And they repented of their evil ways. But in Jonah 4.1, it says, Jonah seemed thought this was very wrong that God was all of a sudden okay with them. And he became very angry. And then the story gets fascinating because Jonah shows his true heart. He kind of goes to the east of the city. He gets his lounge chair. He builds his little structure. He gets his umbrella to sit up. And he sits back in his lounge chair. And he's watching for the big scene. Because in his heart, his expectation is, God, I know you want to kind of bring them back to life. But bring on the thunder and let the destruction begin. But God didn't do that. God didn't do that. Instead, God did something different. He built this, the Bible calls it, a leafy plant that kind of grew over Jonah. And when the leafy plant grew over him in this hot Middle Eastern sun, Jonah was sitting back like, see, this is the life. I'm sitting here on the beach. I got my shade. I got my little drink on the side, and I'm getting to watch the show. I mean, God just set me up to enjoy life and watch the destruction of the rest of the world. And then the very next day, the Bible says that God sent a worm, and the worm began to eat that leafy tree. And before they knew it, the leafy tree died. And there one day, Jonah's like, life is good. And next day, he's like, it is so hot out here. I mean, why did you do this, God? You, you took the tree away from me. I just want to die. It's so hot out here. I just need some water. Just kill me, God. And then verse 9 through 11 of Jonah 4. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about that plant? It, it is, he said. And I'm so angry, Jonah said. I wish I was dead. But God said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concerned for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left, and also many animals? You know, as I read this story, I can't help but to think about that leafy plant. Because that leafy plant symbolizes, I think, the life that we try to build. Christians, some of us are in that personalized belief area. We believe that Jesus is the life for me, but I don't want to take it out there. And we get so focused on trying to build the comfort of my life, still trying to walk into his life, and I think we're missing it. I think we're missing it. You know, as we try to build our lives... Just like Jonah sitting on that east of the city with his lounge chair and his umbrella. Or like, Jesus, you are life. You are the resurrection. I want you to provide the comforts in my life. And the rest of the world is quite simply can go to hell. I know you might not say it. But friends, we live it. We live it because we get so focused on trying to build my life, my comforts, while we turn on the news and just bring the destruction, God. Bring him down. When if we really believe that he is life, 
He can change the Ninevehs in our world. He can. But, in, but we've got to move towards him. Not just an individual secret faith, but a faith that confesses and believes fully in my heart that he is life and I'm going to live out for him. He is life. He is the resurrection. And just like he said to Mary and Martha in John 11, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? That he is the one that will transform your life and that he is the one that can resurrection, resurrect <clears throat> those who are dead even around us. He is the life. Do you believe this? If so, is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? Those are some big implications in your life. Is he just an abstract, you just have an abstract faith that he's kind of good, that he can kind of get me out of the trouble when I bring upon trouble upon myself? Or does he direct everything about my life? Is he your Lord? If so, everything he says should guide your life. I'm not saying this about being perfect, but I'm making the next right step towards him. And the big question is, if he's your life, does your fruit reflect it? Are you walking in life or are you walking in death? Today, you can walk in life and experience the fullness of who he is. But you gotta give it to him. You gotta commit yourself to him. Jesus, you are Lord. And you direct everything about my life so that I can experience your life. And in so doing, may I not be like Jonah. As you brought life to me, may I not just sit on the sidelines and watch other people go down in flames around me. But may I walk in life so that I may be a reflection of you, so that you can resurrect lives around me as well. Let's just close in prayer with that focus. Father, in this moment we confess. We confess that so often we just view you as a helper, not a life transformer. But Lord God, right now, help us to experience you. Transform our lives. Bring life to us. And Lord God, may we walk in life so that we may bring life to others. Lord, forgive us for when we've been like Jonah sitting on the sidelines expecting destruction when we should be going in to bring life and Lord just guide us toward your heart it's in your name we pray amen